From Microbe TV, this is Immune, episode number 22, recorded on July 29th, 2019. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the body's defenders against disease. Joining me today from Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Hello. Welcome back. You're just back, right? I am. I have been away for three weeks. I went to Germany. It was fabulous. When did you get back? Uh, Saturday. You're still a little jet lagged? Not too bad, actually. I think I conquered it both ways pretty fast within about a day and a half. Yeah, coming in this direction is usually not bad, right? Yeah, you just crash when you get <laughs> That's right. here You're and up. then just sleep for about yeah. 12 hours. That's right. Also yeah. joining us from Durham, North Carolina, Steph Langle. Hey there. Great to be back. It's been a while, over, gosh, about a month. Yeah. We we're talking, it was like June 11th. I think we did our last one. So it's good to hear your voices. Yeah. Talk immunology. Everything good down <laughs> south? Yeah, things are good. Things are hot, but, you know, I'm inside all day, so it's really not so bad. But I've been uh, experiments, milking mice. It's been, you know, tons of fun. You're inside <laughs> all day, and then you get in your car, turn on the AC, right? Yes. Then you yep. go home, which is probably AC as well. It is. But we do like we do like to hike and garden, so I try to get outside during, you know, evenings and weekends. So. Mm. Yeah, you need, some, some you need some fresh air. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the uh, air-conditioned air is... I was at ASV last week and spent a lot of time inside air conditioning. I don't like it. It's just, yeah, don't they say in those conference rooms, the CO2 levels build up, it makes your brain function lower? <laughs> Yeah. How did you guys read that study? I didn't, but it makes sense to me. I sort of uh, tire out and fall asleep after a while, I guess. <laughs> right. I was telling I'll Steph, blame it on that. I was telling yes. Steph I was outside all day yesterday with my laptop sitting under an umbrella. It was great. It was a little warm, but the air is so nice and, uh, yeah. you know, birds and all this, bees, well, mosquitoes. Bearing, bearing yeah, pathogens. <laughs> I'll yeah. tell you, that's one thing they do really well in Europe is they, they eat outside. They just, they're, everything's outside. You know, they, they have restaurants and no one sits inside the restaurant. Everybody's out on the, the patios under umbrellas and it's mm -hmm. just, it's lovely. Yeah, nice. If, if it were up to me, I would have no AC in my house, but it's not. Oh my goodness. I have other people. <laughs> yeah, I know. You don't like that. <laughs> I mean, it's fine, but. <laughs> but to all a you need, point, I agree with you. All you need yeah, is, yeah, look, yeah. you have a nice ceiling fan, moves the air around, you know. You don't need to have a cold. I think my wife and daughter are just addicted to the cold. You <laughs> see, and I can't. I'm outnumbered. I have. We have these contests. I raise. So I have a, an app on my phone. I can, I can raise the temperature. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and they put it back down, and I raise it, and they put it back uh. down. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Temperature wars. Yep. I like that. But I, think Virtu I mean, on your phone. It doesn't matter <laughs> if I'm not there, I guess, but oh well. <laughs> True. anyway. Uh, if you like our, our podcast and all the others, maybe, uh, you should consider supporting us. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. We uh, have expenses. And also, if you'd like us to travel and talk to various people around the world in their labs and at meetings, uh, it costs money. So your help would be appreciated. More on that later. We have a follow-up from Bob. By the way, follow-up means if you write an email of the previous about the previous episode, we will read it as a follow-up on the next one. Yeah. It gets read first before everything. Mm -hmm. But if you write an email about two or three or four episodes ago, it goes to the bottom and it could take longer. Right. So if you're if you're thinking about getting to the top, do a follow up and then in the same email talk about something else and then we'll read it first. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Or I got some other way. If you give us a dollar a month, your email wow, automatically yes. goes to the top of the queue. There you go. This is from Bob who writes about immune twenty one. Thanks, people. You did an awesome job of simplifying and explaining this complicated, complicated paper. As the father of a type 1 diabetes child, I hope this information speedily leads to a therapeutic results. As a former scientist, I am fascinated to learn that there are DE, dual expressor cells, not just B and T cells, and their possible role in autoimmune disease. Keep up the great podcasts, Bob. Uh, so, Bob, you are always a scientist. Yes. No one's a former scientist, right? Of course. Because you can still think about science and you have all that experience. So 
you may not be paid for it anymore, right? Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> but you're always a scientist. Probably paid better. <laughs> if you move, if you're paid. collecting your uh, IRA or whatever, you're probably <laughs> getting paid better. I don't know if it's going to be speedy, though. You know, no. it's not always things happen speedily. That's right. Right. I'm going to guess not. If I had to bet, it takes time to do all these complicated things. Okay, we have. Uh, it's my turn to do a paper this week, yes. and uh, I have a cool one, which uh, it's just so cool that. It's it's just a a way of of showing all basic science coming together to maybe make something therapeutic, and mm-hmm. so um, this is a pub- paper published in Science Immunology. It's called B cells engineered to express pathogen specific antibodies protect against infection. The uh, first author is Howell Moffitt. The last author is Justin Taylor. And they are from the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and the University of Washington, which, of course, are both up in Seattle. And everyone listening knows that we have vaccines against many pathogens, and uh, like polio, smallpox, measles, mumps, rubella, yellow fever, hepatitis B, many, many vaccines. And they work, and they can protect you against infection. Those are the viral vaccines. Of course, there are bacterial vaccines too. Mm -hmm. And um, the problem is, though, that there are lots of pathogens for which we don't have vaccines. And people have been working on them for years, (laughs) and they still don't have vaccines, like HIV and respiratory syncytial virus. Right. Influenza virus, well, we have vaccines that aren't great, but we're looking for a universal vaccine Mm -hmm. that you would protect you for many, many years. So this paper kind of addresses that, you know. So vaccine, you, you, you're you given a some some form of the pathogen. It's, it's either a piece of the pathogen or an inactivated form or sometimes an infectious form. And it generates immunity in you and memory as well. Uh, but there's another approach, which is called passive immunization, where you get typically antibodies. And so if you get bitten by a rabid animal, they will, before immunizing you, they will give you injections of antibody against rabies virus at the, at the bite site Mm -hmm. to uh, neutralize virus. And of course we have neutralizing antibodies uh, against Ebola virus that have been used. And the, the idea is that you could give these to people. We have broadly neutralizing Influenza antibodies, broadly neutralizing uh, HIV antibodies. And you can give these to people. They're typically monoclonals, and you can give them to people. But that's expensive. And, Mm -hmm. you know, the one for respiratory syncytial virus, which you can give to very sick babies, costs like $25,000. Yeah. Palivizumab, that's the one that's for RS. I know. I remember when I was reading this. I remember it rolled off of Cindy's tongue last <laughs> the last time she said it. She can say it from now yeah. on. I always stumble. <laughs> can you say it? it it's it also has. It's also called Synergist, but yeah, I don't, um, that's its trade name. Yeah, it's good yeah. because Pavel, Palavizumab is kind of a tongue twister. <laughs> it's expensive. That extra eye. Yeah, and and these these antibodies don't last forever and you, you they're injected and then in a few months they're gone. Right. So you have to be reinfused and it's expensive and not a good solution. Right. Now, some people have said, well, why don't we clone the genes in, encoding these antibodies and deliver them into people with a vector? Okay. And there are a couple of examples in the literature where that's been done uh, in, in animals. And the one I th- I think of a lot is has been done by David Baltimore's lab, where they took a broadly neutralizing antibody against HIV. They cloned the gene, the immunoglobulin gene, the heavy and light chains, into an adenovirus-associated virus vector, and they they immunized, they inject mice with the vector. And for the life of the mice, they make a ton of antibody in their bloodstream, Mm -hmm. and they can resist infection. That's actually in a phase one trial now in people. But the problem there is that you're always making these antibodies. And it's not clear that that's good. Right. And it's not reflexive to the infection. Not so at a all. Consist- right. yeah. consistent level could be good, but 
maybe you need more, maybe you should be having less. Well, you think about the way our immune system evolved, it responds, right? And then right. you make it, and then when the pathogen's cleared, the levels drop to a certain low level, then they go back up again if you're infected. So evolutionarily, we have been selected to have this indu inducibility, not a constant antibody all the time. So there must be right. something bad about that. So even though those approaches are going forward, the the approach here is to try and mimic a, a B cell response where you get infected and then B cells are recruited and that eventually go through the process of rearrangement and hypermutation to make antibodies. They clear the infection and then the levels drop again. Now this paper doesn't do all that; it just starts. But I think it's a pretty it's pretty cool tech, I think, and I think the approach is interesting. It brings up a lot of questions, which is yeah. why I thought it would be uh, fun to do. And of course, as always, I have a virus in the paper yeah. I choose. Just it's kind of a <laughs> little little crutch for me to lean on, you know. Oh, it's good, but it was just a, it, it really is a lot of basic immunology and a little blip of virology. It's a great paper. Yeah. It it's it, the cool thing about this is that every tech used in this paper started as just basic research people trying to figure out how things work right right how antibody diversity works how and we didn't know what we would use that for when we figured no. it out crispr cas you know that's another part of it so it right. all comes together and, and and you know that's why you it's it's tough to say when you're doing research what's the application for human health. Right. And when we write grant applications, we always have to write that. You know, what's the application of this work? And I really like, I dislike this intensely because I, I don't think you often know. And then you, most people make it up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds really good, but <laughs> it's made up. I would like to say, I don't know, but it could be really important or it could mm -hmm. be meaningless. Right. <laughs> it could go right. either way. Why don't you just judge me and the project? Yeah, but I digress. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, as you know, when um, when we when we get antigens, uh, there's somewhere in our body is a B cell with a receptor on the surface that can recognize it, and that that then starts the process of making antibodies. But those B cells with the antibody on their surface, they uh, started out as uh, DNA in, in the nucleus. And I think we've talked about the whole process of antibody did, rearrangement yeah. and so yeah, forth. We, How antibody genes rearrange their, their their heavy parts of their heavy chains and light chains to make diversity and so forth. Um, it's really a remarkable thing for which um, Susumu Tonegawa got the Nobel Prize. Yeah, I think in 1987, something like that. Uh, something. And uh, for figuring it out. It's amazing. It's just remarkable. It's my, it's my favorite part of immunology. <laughs> is it? Sure. Is it really? Yeah, it, it B cell. Yep. Well, T and B cell receptor rearrangement and antigen specific generation of antibodies. Yeah, I love it. And people, that's why you're an immunologist because most students hate that part. It's so <laughs> it's very complicated. I know it is very complicated, but like what knowledge we can glean from those complicated bits, you know? And yeah. people still continue to work on it. I heard mm -hmm. Fred Walt talking last year. You know about the details of recombination and rearrangement of the of the uh, antibody variable segments. It's just amazing, right? People are still trying to figure out exactly how it works. Right. It's driven by curiosity, but as I said, it could turn out to be useful. And especially in the context of this paper, like we wouldn't know <clears throat> if it could work without that basic yeah, knowledge. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. So in, in in this paper, they have access to. Uh, cloned DNA copies of antibodies that are known to neutralize a variety of viruses. Um, and the one they start with is is an antibody against this one, against respiratory syncytial virus. So the uh, palivizumab, which is the monoclonal, one of the monoclonals that's used clinically, they know the DNA for that and they have it. And so the, the goal is to so, try, somehow get that into B cells in a way where it would be regulated mm -hmm. and not just produced all the time. Right. So so they have an interesting approach. Um, they have this antibody uh, as a piece of DNA where the, the heavy and the light chains are joined because normally they would be produced separately, right? Mm -hmm. But they're joined together right. so that they're 
gonna, the protein is going to be produced together and not going to be mixed up with the, the heavy and light chains from the B cell. Right. Because right? the B cell has its own um, heavy and light chains as it is. So they have a, a DNA with light and heavy chain, there's, and there's a linker that's joining them. It's a 57 amino acid linker composed of glycines and serines that they know works. It's used for making single chain uh, antibodies. And so they have that and it's driven by a heavy chain promoter. So in the, in the heavy chain locus, we know there's a promoter that drives uh, expression and they use one of those promoters to drive this. And then they decide to, so that's a, tricky thing to where to put this because yeah. you don't know exactly where, but they decide to put it in an intron where they say it's going to silence all the upstream promoters. So if you think about this, we have a, a heavy chain gene, which is has a promoter, and then there's uh, variable segments and, and other parts like the D and the J segments, and then mm-hmm. there's downstream constant region exons. And, and they decide to put this right in between them because they say it will si- its presence will silence the upstream uh, promoter. And it's going to be in the heavy chain locus, so it, it could be, in theory, regulated uh, properly. And, and then they say, you know, why they did it in the intron and not the exon is if you put it somewhere within the VDJ gene segments, and if it's rearranged, you don't have as much control over that. Mm-hmm, you can't mm-hmm. predict what the protein is going to be because of that recombination. So they were smart to put it in that intron. Yeah. Yeah. They don't want it to be rearranged. That's for sure. Then right. And they, and they still leave open uh, the attachment to the constant region, right? Mm-hmm. So that it, it looks like a normal antibody. It can be expressed on the surface, can be secreted just like a normal antibody. And it can go through ice type switch, right? That's right. It's going to go right. through class switching. Yeah. yeah. So they're trying to mimic exactly what happens in a, to the development of a B cell by putting this in the right place, exactly. They just don't want it to be produced all the time. So they insert it in there. Uh, it's an interesting... First, they use a, a Burkitt cell line called Ramos. It's a B cell line mm-hmm. that, that's known to produce antibodies. And they insert this transgene, which again has the heavy and light chain of this pavilizumab antibody against respiratory syncytial virus. Uh, they insert it using CRISPR-Cas9, which is going to make a cut exactly where they want it. And then they deliver the um, the antibody DNA with a virus vector. So the, the DNA has homology to the cut site. It's going to recombine in, and they can look through enough cells and find ones that are making um, the protein. And so that's the other part here. Not only do we know how antibodies are made, and we use that here, but the CRISPR-Cas is used to deliver... <laughs> And insert this right. DNA right in the right place. Yep. And they had to figure out where to put it. And they say something that's very cool. It looks like a throwaway, but I just want to mention it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we focused on this part of the heavy chain genomic region, which is downstream of a region where single nucleotide polymorphisms with a frequency above 1% have not been reported. And that's cool because they want single nucleotide polymorphisms or base changes from person to person, right? Right. And if you're going to use CRISPR-Cas, you have to use an oligonucleotide to target it. And if there's a lot of polymorphism, it's not going to work. Right, Because right? right. if you're thinking of eventually doing this in people, you have to hit a region which is pretty constant. So it's just one of those things that's so cool about this tech. So the adenovirus-associated virus delivers the antibody cassette and that recombines into the cut site made by the CRISPR-Cas9. And then um, they have a cool assay. that These cells are going to display the antibody on the surface, and they simply ask if um, these cells, if there are some cells in the whole population that can bind the viral glycoprotein, which is the protein against which these antibodies are made. Right. And they have fluorescent F glycoprotein, and they add them to cells, and they can stain them, basically, to see if they're... And they're, in fact, there's antibody on the surface. 30% mm-hmm. of the cells uh, bound the F like a protein, compared to 0.3% in the control cells, which didn't get the uh, antibody cassette. So they it works that in, in the sense that you can make 
B cells that make antibody. So that's step one. Now remember, in these cells, there's an endogenous uh, heavy chain locus, mm-hmm. right? Right. <laughs> and so, kind of a problem. <laughs> they, to think about that. So they had said maybe the, it will be silenced, but they weren't sure. So they check, and um, they they in fact show that there's no endogenous heavy chain expression right? in these Ramo cells. In these Ramo. In these Ramo cells. Right. Yeah. Well, because we'll come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, this putting this antibody in apparently replaces the antibody that was normally made by these these B cells, right? So I'm trying to think here what we're doing. These these cells are making a particular antibody, a specific one, right? Because they're clonal, mm-hmm. right? Right. So the heavy chain locus is all the same. All the loci are the same in both chromosomes. Is that right? Or are they well, different? in the in Ramos the Ramo, cells? in the Ramos cells. Uh, you know? they. I mean, if it's a clone, they should be. Mm-hmm. Both so, copies? It, right. I mean, okay. of a single cell clone, uh, unless Ramo cells are different in some way. I've not worked with them. Yeah, but, but a, a B cell, you would have different alleles, right? Right. Right. But it being, hmm, yeah. I mean, a B cell, one would be rearranged and the other would not be, right? Yeah, but I'm just curious because it is Burkitt's lymphoma cell line. If that changes that, yeah, I don't know much about Ramos. In, in any case, they show that the endogenous heavy chain is silenced, which is what they had predicted. Because they say if you put this transgene in, into this enhancer, it's going to silence the upstream promoter, and so that that actually happens here. Right. So they make a cell line. They can purify these. Remember, the population is only thirty percent. Antibody positive, so they make uh, pure clones, and they show that there's F specific antibody on their surface, and they can add antigen and show that uh, you get calcium flux into the cells. And so this is something I hadn't known about when when B cells bind antigen, calcium goes in. Mm. And so why is that? Do you guys know what's the function yeah, of the, the calcium? Yeah, because the B cell receptor, the complex there, signals, and that's an activation signal for the cells. It drives activation of the cells. It uh, can drive internalization, membrane reorganization, actin cytoskeleton. So the calcium does all that? Yeah. Okay. It activates the signaling pathways. So there's a way to measure that very nicely. And uh, yeah. so it's a nice assay for showing that you have an antibody on the cell surface that will bind the F glycoprotein. Okay, and so in functional, yes, it's functional yeah, in the yeah. sense that so it, it, it turns on the calcium flux, right? That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's one measure of functionality, right? Of course, um, the other measure is whether this antibody neutralizes virus, and we'll get to that. Right. All right. So those are tumor <laughs> cells. Now they say, what if we take B cells from patients? Can we do the same thing? And so they do that from peripheral blood. Now they use CD nineteen as a marker. Is this is this typical for getting B cells from peripheral human. blood? Yeah, human. Yeah, human B cells. Yeah. Yeah. So could Can't you could you sort for C D nineteen positives? Is that how you do it? Because they do yeah. they do magnetic sorting and they just have an antibody to C D nineteen, right? Yeah, and in, in humans it'll select for all B cells, no matter the Okay. Um, mm-hmm, not plasma cells, but B cells. So take C D nineteen positive B cells and then they add cytokines and CD40 ligand, and then they add... CPG. CPG. Yay, TLR9. So, so <laughs> why are they doing all this? They are activating the cells because if they... is Because the beast, the resting B cells are not going to be proliferating. Mm-hmm. And you need to induce them to proliferate in order to make genomic changes with cat CRISPR and all of that, I think. Right. right. And and so naturally, a T cell is going to present CD40 ligand to bind to CD40 and activate that. So it's just a... A pseudo way of doing that, and they use mult, multi-merized CD40, mm-hmm. so it's kind of enhances that to rather than just using one, for instance. Okay, mm-hmm. so then they do the same thing. They add CRISPR-Cas9 with the uh, with the the um, sequence, the genomic RNA sequence that's going to target it to the intron of the heavy chain locus, and they show that they can insert their respiratory syncytial virus antibody. They do the same thing with different transgenes from antibodies against HIV, influenza, Epstein-Barr virus, and they show that they all go in to these cells. 
You can make populations of cells that make antibodies on their surface against each of these. So it's not just working with one antibody, it works with many. Mm-hmm. But it does show kind of, you know, working towards using human cell or well, patient cells, the targeting efficiency does go down. So they mm-hmm. show 72% targeting efficiency of the CRISPR-Cas9 um, monoclonal antibody expression, mm-hmm. but then it does go down in the primary cells, which sure. just speaks to how much more challenging it can be as you're using the diversity of a few cell population. Mm-hmm. Right, because the, the goal is going to be someday you're going to take B cells from a patient and modify them and put them back. Yes, right. And so this has to work over a broad range of humans. <laughs> right. <laughs> like that's the way clinical therapeutics have to work. It can't just work in cells and culture. Right. And they also looked at eight independent donors, right? They got B cells from eight people. Mm-hmm. And um, here the the antigen binding is ranges from 16 to 44%. It's not so, bad. It's not bad, but it's you know it's less than before. But uh, it is, yeah. It less might than be before. okay. But if you think of what the percent of your B cell population that's going to be positive for, let's say RSV, right? Mm-hmm. In the beginning, of course, it, it you know you're going to have like clonal proliferation with memory, but in a naive individual, it's going to be much lower than that. So yes. that's already better. I mean, it would be yeah. like one or two percent. So this is already better. Yeah. So these. Um, B cells that have received these antibodies, they secrete them. They're not just on the surface. They, they are secreted into the medium. They expand and they differentiate in cell culture. So the idea that you can modify a B cell from a patient with this method works. You can introduce various antiviral antibodies. They will be displayed on the surface and they will be secreted. And I guess here they one of the things that's a concern that they did not find was a problem with the Ramos cells is yeah. do the other antibodies for which these B cells mm-hmm. encode uh, response, can they actually produce those, right? Right. Right. And so then you have B cells producing both the patient's endogenous antibody with the inserted antibody. And they mentioned that can be problematic because a lot of our naive B cells encode antibodies for our own proteins. Mm -hmm. And if you're then causing this B cell to kind of upregulate production of this inserted B cell, it's, it's going to hyper proliferate and then maybe you would have autoimmune problems. And so that's a concern. And they didn't find that in those Ramos cells because of a a particular translocation of an oncogene that kind of silences the production of that, that other loci. Yeah, exactly. I was amazed that 20% of B cells can, Bind self antigens. Wow, that is exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> I was shocked. I, I, I'm surprised that it was that high. Yeah, right. I, I guess what they're saying is, twenty percent can bind, but I mean, twenty percent are not going to go through the positive negative selection process in the periphery. I don't know if we just had active twenty percent of B cells binding ourselves. I, I just don't know what that 20% refers to. Do you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, they say 20% of the naive B cell repertoire. Okay. So what does that mean? The DNA or the cells? Uh, it's the well, cells, but I think that the, the, the issue here is that most mm. B cells, unless it's a what we call a T-independent antigen, are going to need T-cell help. Yeah. And the right, gauntlet right. of selectivity for a T-cell during development is much more stringent than for a B cell. And so even if those B cells are wrong, Around, if there's nothing inducing them to produce their antibody, and there's no, and the T cells, which would normally recognize the same thing in mm-hmm. a different form, are tolerized or not existent, then you wouldn't have a problem. Right. I see what you're, yes. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> so basically, they want to know if when they put in an antibody gene, an antiviral antibody gene, are those cells going to still make the endogenous antibody? Okay. Right. And they've got it engineered. So the cells are making lambda light chains, and their transgene is using a kappa light chain, so they can distinguish right. between the two. So that you know, with, with light chains, there's two lambda and kappa. And when you use one, you you don't use the other in a single B cell clone, and you have kind of a ratio of these light chains, kappa and lambda, and and the ratio can determine. There's even your health status. I think there's a type of cancer where that ratio can be flipped. And so that's what they're taking advantage of here is if you use one for one clone or production of one antibody, then it's not going to use the other. Mm. 
So what they find when they use the antibody to influenza virus, most of the B cells that have surface antibody to HA have lost surface lambda light chain, which would be the the endogenous light chain, Mm -hmm. right? And so they say this shows that the cassette that we put in blocks uh, expression of the endogenous antibody, but half of these cells still have the lambda chain on the surface. Yeah, that's a problem. Because mm-hmm. it's a little bit confusing the way they say this section because they, it's exciting the sentence, you know, um, it, don't, it only uses the lambda and uh, in some cells. And then, of course, the next sentence, well, I guess half of those cells are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's a problem. So they say these, in other words, the antibody we put in, the insertion occurs in, this, in the non-productive heavy chain locus, which then turns it on. Right. And so that's yep. why you're getting both antibodies. And and as you had said earlier, they didn't see this in Ramos because they have a translocation that prevents it. It's actually an oncogene translocation, and that's why they're tumor cells, right? They're from a tumor. Yep. And and so they would just have to, I mean, implementing this really, I mean, if you only choose the light chain that's not used by the endogenous antibody, I guess what that's saying is it, it doesn't matter, you can still get expression of that even if you're selecting for kappa. Mm. So they have to figure out how how to not allow that to happen or they'll get co-expression. Yeah. Yeah. But but they do say this, be, because both heavy chain loci are, are expressed, they say maybe we could make dual antibody producing B cells, right? We could put uh-huh. a, a different cassette <laughs> in each locus. So nice. they did that. That's why they got it into science immunology. <laughs> yes. Because if you stop before that, it's be like, like wah, wah, wah. <laughs> So they put two uh, adeno-associated virus vectors into the cells, one with an RSV antibody and an uh, influenza virus antibody. And about 6% of the cells will bind both antigens, the RSV and the influenza virus antigen. So cool. Right, Which so sounds great, except it's still only 6%. That's Yeah, pretty, that's true. Pretty low. But I don't know. In but a, they got it. If so. you're infected and you're making antibodies, at what percent of your B cells are making antibodies well, at, at peak? I well, don't know. I mean, is it? I can't imagine it's more than 10%. Well, they would They would have to select these out and put only those in, right? Sure. Sure. Well, they could do that's that, right? They could select them and proliferate them in culture and it's just it just shows the limitation of the in vitro production of these, right? It's yeah. going to be difficult to scale that up. Yeah, sure, mm-hmm. sure. Uh, but it is, I mean, gosh, designer antibodies for multiple, well, not only multiple pathogens like they did here, but multiple epitopes of the same pathogen. Yes. If you're trying mm-hmm. to ward off, you know, escape. Now, one thing I didn't quite get, so in this experiment, they, they seem to be having an antibody produced from both heavy chain loci, right? Mm-hmm. Now, why is that? Because if you just put one in, why wouldn't the one go to both loci also in the previous experiment? I right? guess you could double. You could So if you do the CRISPR, I think it only acts on the one one copy. So I guess you could do it again and hope it hits the other one. You could that's surprised. another way. I would to do think it. I would I would think at a certain frequency it would hit both though cuz if it's the same sequence it should, right? Huh. It could. Although I don't know, they didn't they didn't test whether there are ones that only expressed their antibody of interest and not the endogenous actually had two copies, did they? No. So they don't no. know yeah, that. Right. They just know no. it doesn't have it's not expressing the other one. Well, this and they're was, assuming in the double they don't actually look for light chains at all. There may be still I mean, yeah, sure. light chain expression. We don't know. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That that anyway. could be could have been expounded upon a bit. But yeah. the 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 down the outcome here is that you can put multiple antibodies into your B cells. I don't know if that's good because B cells don't normally do that, right? I know. Maybe there's a reason. Right? <laughs> they, yes. Exactly. <laughs> Actually, they get into some of these caveats later. So. Well, you would run into a problem if you later had, for example, isotype class switching, and then you start making two different ones. Mm-hmm. That could be problematic because each isotype is designed for a different purpose, right? Yeah, um, sure. And also, if you get somatic hypermutation, and you start mutating your different loci differently, you could have developing antibodies that now become autoreactive 
or mm -hmm, right? right and the selection is not there i just think that that you know you can run into that problem there's a reason why you express only one of the two <laughs> right. genes of antibodies because you start unlike t cells you start messing with the sequence later right i mean it's mm -hmm. it's absolutely astounding yeah. that t cells do this at all right it's crazy yes <clears throat> it's it's interesting enough that both t cells and b cells cut and reorganize their genes which is just crazy right when you know gen genetics <laughs> You just right, don't do that, right? right? Well, you have a gene and it, <laughs> it encodes a protein, right? Mm -hmm, but these just, mm -hmm, they, yeah. they just cut and flip around all the sequences and, and change the sequences. But now even after the B cell develops, now you can still change the sequences. That's that's pretty amazing that you can do that. And so right, if you start doing that on different loci, I think you could just run into a big problem. Mm -hmm, when they, mm -hmm. they do mention that in the discussion that, that they, somatic hypermutation, they don't actually go forward with that and, and trying to see if now, okay, if you take this further after isotype switching and see, will it actually um, somatically hypermutate and what happens after that? Yeah. I think that they say that that's kind of some future experiments. Yeah. Yeah. That there's a lot to be done here. This is by no means ready. No. Right. For people, but that's one of the questions, whether these cells would do that, right? Well, because it's an intron. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, well, I mean, it's still going to be expressed, I guess, but it's just, yeah, I don't. If if aid acts upon it, then it would be fine. But yeah, be interesting. I'm sure they're looking at it mm -hmm. for sure. All right, so we know these B cells can make antibodies, or they, can they protect against infection? So for this, they go to a mouse model of respiratory syncytial virus infection. They take now B cells from mice, and they insert the antibody genes just as we have described so far with the same methodology, CRISPR-Cas9, uh, delivering the gene by an adeno-associated virus vector. And um, then they put them back in. They show that the antibodies are displayed on the surface, and they put them back in uh, to the mice. So these cells secrete antibodies. And they also do uh, class switching. Which they, which they didn't show before. Well, right? I, don't, I don't know. I mean, they they show loss of IgM and IgD, but yeah. they didn't right. show gain of any yeah. of the other ones. Okay. So right, is that right. actually just loss of expression or is it a class switch? I'm, I, I, jury's out for me on that one. They were allowed to they say, point. they were allowed to say uh, loss of know. IgMD. I know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't buy that. I wouldn't have I loved that. I said he was a reviewer. Yeah, right, right. Nope. What would you, you would, uh, you would want them to show the production? I would say either it might indicate or I would ask them to see what it actually switched to. to. Or yeah, let's look for or some IgA or IgE or, I, right, like what are right. the, what are the isotypes? Yeah. You could look for IgG, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. That would be the easiest one, yeah. yeah. Well, and actually, and if, because they, they're they saying that they included, <laughs> now I have to say it, Cindy, you should say, polyvizumab? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I don't even remember how to say it now, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, they that the RSV-specific antibody, I believe, I didn't look this up, but I'm sure it's an IgG. So if that sequence undergoes class switching after, would it be as it, as effective. Yeah, I, I know that I know. that part of it is is kind of confusing, or at least just up the jury's out. It's hard to it's a little confusing. It doesn't matter for the results they have here, but it's an important no, it's an important no, future I, thing to to yeah, know if they're switching. For sure, for sure. And if you think about it, RSV is a you know, it's a respiratory mucosal, so you would want maybe some IgA yeah, entering into sure. the lungs. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah. if, that would be consideration. But easy enough to look at, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So they, they take these B cells, which they've engineered to make the RSV antibody. They put them back into mice, uh, over 10 million cells back into mice, wild-type mice. Six days later, they find antibodies against the virus in the serum. And not in control mice, of course. But these these antibody levels, which they say are from 3 to 29 micrograms per mil, go down 25 days they're back down to baseline right. yep and of course there's no there's no virus yet so i don't know if that would have made a difference it would have been interesting they do no uh, memory responses in this paper so i'm really interested right. to know if there is a memory response in these animals i know <laughs> i know and i think that would have helped answer our 
as some of our questions we've had. Mm -hmm. They did Mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so these mice are challenged intranasally with virus. And Uh, is this a good model for this? Well, um, I think we should be using like the cotton rat, right? I think that's a better <laughs> cotton, RSV. cotton rat is better, yeah. But I don't know if you can do the B cell experiments as easily. But um, this works because the mice, uh, it does the virus does replicate right. in, in these animals, and so seven days after giving the mice the engineered B cells, they inf- in uh, infect them, and then five more days later, they measure virus titers in the lung. And so um, they see not a lot of virus, but 5,000 PFU mm. in the lungs yeah. from, from control mice, which is really paltry. I mean, right. mm-hmm. it's not much at all. And nothing in the mice that got the antibody. Right. All right. So this is not a great model because there's no disease, and that's what you'd like to see if it's protecting mm-hmm. you against disease. Mm-hmm. 5,000 PFU. There's no time course. You don't know really if it's replication or just inoculum just there. It's there yeah right right I mean, what you can say is the antibody has cleared it but that's not right. surprising right so it's not a great experiment but um that's what they have yeah but cotton rat would have been better it's a much better model for this because they do develop lung disease right 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 but what they can do is use immunodeficient mice which i'm sure are not available for cotton rats right <laughs> i i yeah <laughs> I'm, not. I'm assuming that i'm assuming that <laughs> although we do have we do have um immunocompromised pigs so maybe they've maybe they've gotten to the cotton rat how do you what are they the pigs are they rag knockouts yep they are they cool. don't have yep don't have b or t cells we use them we well we use them for norovirus infection studies back in my phd's uh, phd lab to, oh how do you maintain them <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so I I mean how we derive germ-free piglets it's the same. You it's a terminal surgery for the sow. She's under anesthesia and we take her whole uterus out with the piglets and we birth them into isolators hmm. and they are maintained there in sterile conditions and they do just fine. I mean we you know you you wouldn't want them under normal conditions because they would wouldn't be able to survive right. uh, likely. And then, yeah, maintain them up to like three weeks. You can do your infection studies and they work just as well. I mean, they work just like the mice versions. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, Less reagents, you know, <laughs> available. So they, they want to do this experiment in immunodeficient mice because they say in transplant recipients, respiratory syncytial infection is a real problem because these people are immunosuppressed, right? right. So there's a mm-hmm. big risk of serious respiratory tract infection, and death. So they use RAG1 knockout mice, which don't have B or T cells, and they transfer the B cells into them, which have been engineered to make the antibody. They make, the mice make antibodies in the serum just as before. They they maintain them a little bit longer, 40 days, and then they start to decline, and they go down just like in the, the wild-type mice. Um, they challenge them, and then again, they get protection against virus similar to uh, the, the experiment with the wild-type mice. So, in other words, you put B cells into mice that lack B cells, they will make antibody and protect you against infection. Now, should they have compared this um, to just the injected monoclonal antibody to see how it compared therapeutically? Yeah, I think so, because yeah. you could argue this is just like injecting monoclonal antibody into mice, right? I mean, it's it's right. being produced by cells, but... And I guess it would it is lasting longer. I think they would argue that you would probably not get up to eighty days. Yeah, probably not. I don't know though. I mean, they started off. My my beef with this paper is that they started off saying that the the benefit of doing it this way is that you could have long term expression right. of the antibody at, at physiologic levels. Right. Right. Um, I don't know that we have any idea whether these are realistically physiologic levels. I don't, I don't know what those concentrations rise to in an infected individual. Mm-hmm. I didn't look that up. And it seems like at least in the mouse model, even if they have basically no immune system, no T cells and B cells, <laughs> they still don't survive very long. And if you put them into a, a normal mouse, they're, they're gone within you know, yeah. 25 days. Right. So For is sure. that, is it really any better than yeah, the monoclonal antibody injection? 
So, and that would have been a really good comparison. Yeah. So I think it's a really cool set of experiments that's leading us in a direction, but I'm not, I, I feel like they push the limit a little bit here on their interpretations and their conclusions. I think that if they had shown that these cells remain a long time and then when you challenge, they increase and secrete antibodies again, that would have been cool, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. We have no idea, yes. right? No. Well, yeah, right. I mean. That's what they want to do. They want to make engineer B cells so that they re- stay in you forever. And right. when you get I challenged, think. you will respond. Yes. That's right. So if you're going to get a transplant, they'll take out B cells before the transplant you know, engineer them while you're getting your transplant. And then when you're immunosuppressed, they would give them back to you and they would last a long time, not just mm-hmm. a couple of months, because you're right. If it's just a few months, antibody mm-hmm. would do the same thing, right? Which is what we do now. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe it speaks to the fitness of these cells and not being able, I mean, possibly like we were talking about some of the, the somatic hypermutation and things that happen after recombination. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not being able to last as long. Mm. Then the final thing they do is look at uh, the spleens and bone marrow of recipient mice to see where these B cells are. Mm -hmm. And they see they find thousands of them making the antibody in the spleen and bone marrow. In the bone marrow, they have markers of plasma cells, which are what long-lived antibody-secreting cells, right? Yep. So that's promising. And in the uh, spleen, they have markers of... (laughs) Here you go, Cindy. Isotype switched B- memory B cells. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so B cells in the spleen made CD19 and 38, but not IgM D. Or, so they don't actually show that other classes are there. They just show absence of uh, M and D as before. Mm-hmm. So I guess they would argue that these cells have il- infiltrated the bone marrow and spleen are be- and are becoming established and would stay there for a long time, but they don't actually look at that, which is kind of surprising, right? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, what time point are they? Are these mice in Figure Eight? I pull that up. Uh, eighty seven. How long? Oh, eighty seven. So then, I guess, yeah, you would like to know, and maybe they just wanted to get this out there, get it published. Maybe they're at, you know, day they, they finished these, and they just didn't. They wanted to publish it, and now they're going to continue with this long, long term studies. But yeah, you would want to see if they stay longer, mm-hmm. and then have a memory. Right. Memory is the key. I'm sure they're working on it. We'll see it right. <laughs> one way or another. Well, so a couple of things um, after that's the end of the experiment. So a couple of things I wanted to point out. Um, first of all, this is a cool approach for all the reasons we've said. But in addition, a lot of these broadly neutralizing antibodies are really rare. Like, yeah, right. like the HIV-1 uh, BNABs, as we call them. They're, they're very rare and you know, they seem to take a long time to generate a lot of somatic hypermutation is going on. So if we could just take the DNA encoding those already made and put them into B cells, it would be great, right? It would really solve a lot of issues. And so that's that's another reason why they're, they're trying to get this to work. And then they talk a little bit about um, B cells that make two different antibodies. Mm-hmm. So they said, you know, we could make only one or we can make two. We like to make two. I don't know. We favor. They they say we favor co-expression, but there may be downsides, right? Right. (laughs) As we said before, normally B cells don't make because multiple heavy and light chains because you're going to get a whole mix of different antibodies that are Mm -hmm. different and they may not all be optimal, right? And so they say we get around that because they're linking the the heavy and the light chains, right? But, um, You know, some of the potential issues, you could get less antibody if you're making two as compared to one, right? Right. Um, They could use different heavy chains unless you control class switching, as we were talking about before, and they're they're working on that as well. And then one the, of the other things they mentioned, oh, I don't know if maybe you're going to mm-hmm. get to this, is that if you're expressing two different antibodies, especially if they're on the surface, right. they need to signal through the... B cell receptor complex, you know, to do that right. same flux that you were talking about. And if there's a set amount of those, I don't know what happens if you now titrate it onto two different antibodies. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. I just, I wonder, because signals often depend on, you know, the the expression level and the duration and things. And so if you now split the same number of signaling um 
components between two right. different antibodies, does that change the effectiveness of a stimulation and production? Mm. I don't know. Yeah, it's important yeah that's a good yeah. point. And maybe you'd have increased exhaustion, B-cell exhaustion. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Then they also address this decline in antibody levels, you know, serum antibody levels were not stable long-term. I mean... They not they're not in normal situations either, right? Antibody levels all, always decline after an infection, right? Mm-hmm. Right. So I don't know why they're so worried about that, but they say maybe that that's because they're cultured in vitro and that's a problem. Maybe um, there's some off-target effects of Cas9 that we don't know about. Maybe they're rejected as foreign by T and B cell responses, right? Hmm. The, this this protein on the surface. You're right. It's a good point that that worry or that concern is fine. I mean, right. It's fine that they go down normally. So just challenge them again and see if they expand and see if you have a memory response. You can, yeah. you can right. answer that mm-hmm. question. Yep. Now, now they do say in this paragraph, in these rag knockout mice where they did the experiment, although titers declined after 40 days, the mice were protected for 82 days because the cells persisted, but they did not appear to respond to infection, the B cells. And I don't know what, uh, what experiment they're talking about. I, I didn't see no. it. <laughs> they, they, yeah, I don't know. I, there's no proliferation. Or there's no, I mean, we're not, yeah, there's no culture experiments. I'm not they sure. They say that's because they're rag mice and there's no T cell help. But they could, yeah. have, they could have done it in the normal mice, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, they could have. Yes. That's weird. <laughs> I don't know why it's. Um, and then they talk about... Um, these B cells, these engineered B cells getting into germinal centers and undergoing affinity maturation. And they haven't looked at this. We talked a little bit about this before. It's probably something they want to look at, um, whether these antibodies are being uh, further modified, these Mm -hmm. antibody molecules, right? I think it's a really important thing to look at. Definitely. Yeah, we have not assessed whether aid will mutate the inserted genes. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I'm sure they're looking at it. That's that's important. Um, and yeah, so then here's the scenario: you have um someone getting a, a stem cell transplant, right? So they're going to be uh, immunosuppressed, right, severely because you're going to destroy uh, their own stem cells. So mm-hmm. they think we can then take their B cells out beforehand, engineer them. And we can give them antibodies to respiratory syncytial virus, metanumovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, CMV, all big problems in transplants, and protect them. And we can prevent thousands of hospital visits, disabilities, and death every year. Wow. <laughs> I like their optimism. <laughs> um, and, and they say, you know, that... So what you're going to do here is take cells from each patient and modify mm-hmm. them and put them back. This is a yep. big deal. Right? Personalized medicine. Yep. Personal. Yeah, it's, definitely. It's very expensive. It's time consuming. You know, it's hard. It's not easy to do. It's the same mm-hmm. thing they do with CAR T cell therapy, right? They take your. That's exactly you right. And put them back. That's hard to do. So they yeah. say, you know, for low risk populations, we're not going to do this. So maybe we could develop universal donor cells that everybody could get. Hmm. Right? That, that would not worry about getting them from you, but they would be frozen away and they grow them up and put them in you if you're a low risk. So that's an interesting idea. That's basically it. So it's, I think it's an interesting um, conceptual piece of work. There are lots of holes in here that need to be addressed, but I think the idea is interesting and certainly w- worth uh, pursuing. And I'm sure mm-hmm. definitely lots of people are doing it. So that's why I thought. And it was the, cool. and the, um, the, the cast CRISPR cast, they kind of, mention it too that they're they kind of glossed over the fact that they're still off target effects right mm-hmm. yes and uh, until yeah, yeah. we have a better more specific less off target issues with uh ca- crisp and crispr cas9 it's probably not going to be used to modify cells that are going to go into humans right or there has to be I- some really highly selective right mechanism to purify out those ones that are not problematic right yeah i mean this this is a problem because we, it hasn't really been looked at mm-hmm. extensively and before you put modified cells into people you really need to know so you have to yeah. do, you have to do whole genome sequencing and see if there's some off-target effect 
That's that's right. And so that's there, a, if, another added expense to yeah, I was the just personalized say the cost medicine is part. Really, mm-hmm. well, you have to find a, a a cast that doesn't do it. You cannot mm-hmm. sequence everyone's genome to make sure there are no. Right. So people are working on modifying Cas9, finding other casts from yep. various microorganisms that have fewer off-target effects. So, you know, everyone thinks that this is ready to go. It's not. It's <laughs> right. to a lot more work to, to get rid of all these issues, right? Mm-hmm. And people are working left and right on it. It's amazing yeah. what people are doing. Uh, so stay tuned. It's, you know, it's going into some people, but I think it's going to be a while before we, we find the final version that's going to work. Uh, let's do a couple of emails here. Um, yes, we have some built up. The first one is from Bob, who sends us an article that uh, Cindy should like because it shows how the MAC, the membrane attack complex Mm -hmm. on a bacterial (laughs) surface forms. They have some nice uh, visualizations of this. It's a Nature Communications article, so it's open access. And they uh, they show how these complement proteins come together and make this membrane attack complex. So... This is cool because we talked about complex, not too uh, compliment, not too long ago. Yep. They're just I wonder if that's the images. same Bob, this uh, who did the follow up. I don't know. There are lots of Bobs, know. right? <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> uh, why don't you take that next, uh, the next one, Steph? Sure. Oh. Sure. All right. So Cal writes, "Hello, writing from Lothian. Is that how you pronounce that, Maryland?" I think so. Outside of D.C. where it's still warm, 79 degrees Fahrenheit, 29 Celsius at 9 p.m., summer has arrived. I'm a toxicologist and risk assessor for a a federal agency in D.C., not a microbiologist, couple of immunology courses while at grad school, but I volunteer at the Smithsonian uh, National uh, Museum of Natural History, and I had the privilege of being trained on Outbreak. Awesome. Awesome, which Outbreak, I've seen it. I know Vincent did a twiv there. You saw it, Cindy? Yep. Yep. Is it gone now? No, it's there for two years or three years. Oh, two yeah. years. Oh, yeah. great. Okay. People can still see it. I got turned on to the TWIV group of podcasts by a neighbor who somehow knows Alan Dove. <laughs> <laughs> Not very cool. I only understand maybe 25% on a good day, but I can generally follow along and always learn something new. That's fine. Most of us, even us. Maybe we're at 50%. Listening back to issues, I heard Stephanie talk about The Pregnant Scholar. I wanted to alert you to the book Motherhood, The Elephant in the Laboratory. Full disclosure, I'm a contributor, but I made and make no money from this project. That's great. We can add that book to, I don't know if we have an immune book (laughs) suggestion list, but we can start one. Uh, The book was conceived and edited by Emily Monason, and it contains collections of women's stories organized by decade. Uh, do you, can you see how things have and not changed? Worth a look. Also, for the TWIF folks, you might also find Emily's most recent book, Natural Defense, Enlisting Bugs and Germs to Protect Our Food and Medicine, Island Press 2017, to be of interest. Thanks for the hours of entertainment and education. Well, thanks. Yeah, yeah I've well, read this I, book. I've oh, you have? Book. Yeah. It's good. So a, uh, a former student um, whose committee I was on and uh, did some mentoring for her or whatever, when she went to leave, she gave me a copy of this book. Oh. And I read it and I thought it was fabulous. I'm going to have to check it out. Great. Yeah. yeah it was good. Great. So our next one's from Mo who wants, Mo wants, I'm not native English. I need subtitle. 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 Well, or maybe like, uh, well, I don't, don't know what that means. What does it well, mean? Well, I think he means what you have the, the text Time of the stamp? recording. Maybe transcripts. Text. Transcripts. Yes. Transcripts. transcripts. Yeah. Yeah. But oh, that, okay. okay. I, I'm sure. Is there an app that can do that? Yeah. Or? So we were, we've been talking about this over on Twiv, and actually, Alan had two of these apps as a pick. So you can now run uh, podcasts through these apps, and they'll generate text files, but hmm. they still need a lot of work afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I imagine for scientific terms, it would be very challenging. And we have over on Twim a. Uh, PhD student who is doing transcripts for us. Oh, that's nice. Um, but uh, she's just doing TWIM, and I don't want to bother her with others because she's a PhD student. Yeah. Right? So yeah. It's amazing that she does it. <laughs> I'm amazed she's doing TWIM. Well, the funny thing is she, um, I don't want to keep saying she, let me find out her name, transcript. Sarah, Sarah Morgan at Pitt. At Pitt. So she she was doing them before she she entered grad school. She was like cranking out one a week, and as soon as she went to grad school, they, they went to one a month, and now one one every two months because she's busy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. So uh, anyway, Mo, we're working on these programs, and uh, it's not going to happen right away. But stay tuned. 
play it on half X and we'll all talk really slow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's an uh, option, though. Yeah, sure. Why don't you do one more? Do Ryan, Cindy. Okay. Uh, so Ryan writes, I want to update on Jerry's statement from TWIV on vaccine bills on state and federal levels in debates for the immune audiences as of June 2019. Now, is this something that you guys talked about on TWIV? Is that why he's responding to that? Because yeah, I didn't hear that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. So he puts in several links, which we can put in the show notes. Um, about various different states. So Maine uh, and California. California did it a few years ago after the measles um, outbreak at Disney. And then Ohio. So oh, California's bill is SB 276. Ohio's bill is HB 268. Um, and they're all basically eliminating um, anything that's a request for a vaccine exemption other than a medical request. And I can add to this that New York also did the same thing. Mm. It was about a month and a half ago, uh, maybe two months ago, they passed a bill to remove religious exemptions. So there's only medical exemptions and it, it really, it's, it's causing quite a uh, backlash to say the least. I know I'm getting some hate mail. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it definitely, yeah. I mean, it's tricky. It's tricky when you throw in religion. I mean, I know how we all feel about this, but it's, it's yeah, politically very tricky. Yeah. Well, vaccines are not a belief system. That's the problem, right? Right. They right. are, in order for them to work, public health measures, we have to have a lot of people doing them. That's right. So if you have a medical reason not to get a vaccine, that's perfectly valid. But mm -hmm. to say that your faith, you know, doesn't allow for it. It just, it's not going to work. You have to, right. if you, your faith doesn't want you to kill people, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> that could be right. an outcome. That's a good point. So I, re I respect true. people's faiths, but I think you need to think about, um, you know, public health in general. And that's, that's really what it's all about. Yeah. For sure. I know that and people, I, you know, uh, there's, go ahead. I know people get very worked up about it, but I think you need to look at the vaccines and how well they work and, and understand them and, and not be afraid of the, the naysayers who really are not telling the truth, uh, to be, to be honest, they, all the bad things they say about vaccines are simply not true. So if you're using religion as an excuse not to be vaccinated because you're afraid of them, I don't think that's a good thing either. Yeah. And I think it's hard to tease out. That's, that's where the problem is, right? Because there are people who genuinely have, uh, faiths, uh, that, they prohibit them from being injected with things and so forth. And they believe that very earnestly and they follow their religion very carefully. Maybe that's, maybe that's a valid reason for them not to do it. I don't, I don't, I still think they should be protecting their children, but uh, you know, if that's, if that's their belief, that's fine. But where you draw the line is what, what is a religion? What isn't a religion? Right. And that, that becomes tricky because now it's on school systems and politicians and so forth to define that you know we're going to we're going to say that your religion is a religion and yours is not and i think that's a problem yeah for sure i i don't understand religious exemptions but that's because i'm not very religious i suppose i i, I assume people who have one have thought about it but i, I don't see how it can work yeah I mean, it is a good point what you bring up that the two the two religious concepts are in contrast with each other, you know, an exemption from something like vaccines. But then if you believe that people should not die or, you know, otherwise be suffering, I mean, those are in conflict with each other. And mm -hmm. you have to think about that. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, this can become a political issue next year during the elections, right? It will. Oh, people, sure. people will yeah. run on platforms saying, I will give you the right to choose your vaccines. And this is a, dis this yes. is a disaster. Yes. And we're definitely seeing that already. I know Texas, Ohio, a couple. I, yep. I, I'm just stunned because if you look at the history of vaccines, right, people were dying to have vaccines against polio yep. and so forth. And their parents yep. brought their kids to be vaccinated. And now it's turned the other way. Although I think it's, it still is a small fraction of the population that are very vocal. It is. It is. Yeah. And I think, I think I'm seeing a lot of people in my personal life who aren't in science and who were and, you know, questioning vaccines kind of reverse with a lot of this measles. And it's sad because what that means is people have to suffer for you to believe that they work. And, and that's, yeah, you know, 
very unfortunate. That's almost human nature, though, to some degree. You want to, right. you, you learn better when it happens to you versus when someone tells you what to do, right? This is the problem of parents, right? Sure. You want to prevent <laughs> your child from having something terrible happen to them by telling them, don't do that because I know something bad is going to happen. They're like, no, no, no. But then when it happens, they're like, okay, now I got the message. <laughs> yeah. So it's, right, right. but it, I, I think it's it's human nature, unfortunately. Um, and I, I kind of predicted that. I wrote an op-ed a long time ago. Yes, and I'm like, you did. Yeah, it's, it, you know, it's societal amnesia. You forget and people yes. become complacent and they're like, it's not going to happen to me. I don't need that. And then when it happens, they're like, oh, okay, well, I'll, then then now I believe and I'll, I'll vaccinate my children. It's like, ah. Which then you wonder, like you're saying, where, where Vincent, where do you draw the line? You know, wh- when, do, when do we step in and say, I, I understand you have this belief or this desire, but we know better and we're going to put a law down. And you can argue, but we actually know what's going to happen and, and we're going we're gonna to protect us regardless of what you say. Yeah, I think it requires a discourse, though. And uh-huh. The problem now is that it's all heated and antagonistic, and people yell at each other, right? I'm not taking your vaccine. You just want to kill us. You know, there's no calm discussion. Whenever I no. go on Twitter and talk with people, it always escalates into them saying, I don't believe anything you say. Mm-hmm. You no, know, why do you have to be so extreme? Why can't you and I just talk? And if you have an issue, I'll find out what your issue is and we can talk about it. But it never happens that way. And so no. I, I wonder what is the agenda there if they don't want to talk about it calmly. I don't get it. What, why they listen to people who tell them things. That well, there, right. there are studies on this where, you know, if you, if you say something that disagrees with someone's value, they'll dig in their heels if, and, and they'll fail to think rationally about the, the argument, right? Mm, interesting, yeah. Good or bad, that's yeah. it's, it happens. All right, let's uh, do some picks. Our monthly vaccine. <laughs> I know. I'm glad we do. I mean, we need to do it. It's, we keep it's not going to go away. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think though the people who are listening are not the ones that we need I know. to talk to. They're all probably saying, "I've heard you say this ten times." Do the <laughs> yeah, same thing on Twitter. I'm sorry, but but if we can give them arguments to help go fight the fight, yeah, that's, that's important. True. Sure, that's, that's yeah, so definitely. it's still worthwhile if they can take something away from this and say, "I heard from the experts." Here's here's the argument, or here's what we should be saying. I mean, for example, you can go to the CDC website, mm-hmm. and they will list all the side effects of all the vaccines. And you can see they're really pretty minor. When people say side effects, you know, it's, oh, my gosh, there are side effects. They're really minor. And if you if you send uh, one of these individuals there, they'll say, oh, I don't trust the CDC. And you can't, that's right. and that's it. You can't get yep. past that. Mm-hmm. It's a government agency. I don't trust them. So it's it's all this stuff that you can't get beyond, even though all this all the facts are there and it's really well done. And the CDC, for the most part, you know, does the right thing. They will not listen to them. And if you're talking about vaccines, they say, you know, you're being paid by a company, right? I wish. <laughs> all right. Let's do some picks. <laughs> Steph, what do you have for us? So I originally came into this episode not having anything, but I was able to find, I had mentioned at the beginning that there was a study that determined or had looked at the CO2 accumulation in a conference room Mm -hmm. when people gather. And so this is just kind of a little infographic of that. Did I post the right thing? I don't even think I posted it. Yes, I did. Yeah. Yes. And so I thought this was interesting. Yes, good. I got the right thing and just wanted to put it out there. So that's what, that's what I got. So if we're at a seminar, we're getting tired. It's because the CO2 levels are going up. Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's what they're suggesting. That's going to be right? my argument. <laughs> that's my argument too. That's why I need more coffee. <laughs> I saw, I was at a talk and uh, a guy was showing uh, how decisions by judges um, vary ah, at yeah. the time of day. And I, yeah. I forgot how he, how he, um, rated them but like at 3 p.m when when everyone's hungry their blood sugar is low that you get the most ridiculous decisions by judges so oh my gosh that's a little scary isn't that scary we're humans look we're humans right yeah right i mean hmm. cindy what do you have 
So mine's not quite so fun. Um, I When I was in Germany, I was visiting my friend at the Max Planck and, and she got an email and she shared it with me and we were talking oh, about this. Okay. So there was, you may have heard the story or may not have. So there was a woman who um, worked at the Max Planck and she was at a conference, scientific conference in Crete and disappeared. And they found her body and it turns out she, I won't go into the details, but she met a very tragic end. Uh, and basically the reason why I picked this is because when I've gone to conferences from the time I was in grad school, I would put on my running sneakers and I would go out and that's how I would explore the area of wherever the conference was. And, you know, I'm often by myself, just take off and nobody knows where you are. And so this woman has a habit. She had a habit of running every day and she would do this when she went to conferences and whatever and people didn't see her and they were just like, oh yeah, she must be working on her talk and then when she didn't show up for her talk that day and a half later everyone was like, wait, what? What's going on? Mm -hmm. They opened up a room and everything was there except for her running sneakers and it turns out that she was murdered. Mm. And it's just, it's horrific. That's right. um, but they, they put it in, you know, it was mentioned in nature. But I'm just putting it out there just because it's, it, it could be me. You know, I do this all the time when I go to conferences. People have no idea where I am. And I put my running sneakers on and I go out. And things can happen. And so just, just be aware that, you know, have a buddy, have somebody who knows where you are. Um, and know your surroundings when you go to a conference. And I, just the last one I was at, I went walking and I realized I was in a very bad neighborhood and turned around and went back. But, you you know, you're in a different country and nobody knows where you are. It's just kind of sobering. Yeah, it's probably a good idea to go with somebody, right? Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of discourse on this on, on Twitter about, you know, where conferences are placed. Um, I think there was the recent conversations around a recent big, big conference that wasn't particularly in an area that people felt safe, particularly mm -hmm. women who were there. You know, but these are conferences, especially for trainees that are really important for connecting, for making, you know, practicing those skills. And, and it's really how do you uh, maximize safety but, but, you know, not inhibit people as well. It's very challenging. And that you write the story is just very <laughs> sad. Hmm. Yep. All right. I will uh, try and raise the. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the, we started up, went down, but we'll go. We'll end up. I have a book to recommend. It's called Nobel Prizes and Nature's Surprises by Erling Norby. So I next month I'm going to Sweden to interview uh, Doctor Norby, who is a virologist who has sat on committees to deciding Nobel Prizes for quite a number of years, and he's written a bunch of books, three or four books. And uh, this is the second. I've I finished one, and this is the second one, which uh, it has a lot of immunology in it, which is why it's oh, good nice. for... Oh. And the first yeah. chapter is about Frank Brenner, mm. who was an Australian virologist, and they considered him for many years for a virology prize, but they could never get over the the hump of whatever it is to, to decide. And then he started doing great immunology and he ended up sharing an immunology prize. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a cool story about um, him. And then other chapters, um, a divided Nobel and a new era in immunology. So he talks about how immunology became more and more robust science. And they, and the interesting thing is that's how the Nobel committee recognizes a new science. They start to give prizes and it kind of validates mm -hmm. it in the world. And it happened for virology in different areas as well. Mm. Chapter three, more Nobel prizes in immunology, the origin of lymphocytes engaged in immune responses, antibody structure, all the things we talked about today, immunity, infections, transplantations. So um, it's pretty cool. He has neat insight. Uh, into the prize selection, and he talks about. He said, "You'll you'll be amazed. Many of you probably don't think about Nobel prizes, but they're the most well-known prize in science. Right? It makes science visible to a huge part of the world. Mm -hmm. And no matter what you feel about prizes like this, some people don't like them. Mm -hmm. It really publicizes science and." Some people are nominated every year over and over and over and over and never make it. <laughs> and one person, at least one person, was nominated the first year and got it. That was Joshua Lederberg. 
He was like mm. 30 years old or something. So it's a really cool story and uh, it's a cool process. And this is a little insight behind it. And so I say, how, so, how does he get away with being able to tell all those stories? Because I thought a lot of that <laughs> is supposed to be under lock and key for like 50 years or something like that. Is that a myth? So in the, <laughs> no, the first book he, he had taken those archives, which, you know, go up to 50 years ago. And he talked about he and mm. other people have gone in and studied the archives. Yeah. So he, Aha, you okay. can do that. If you can apply to look at the archives and they gave him permission and he would go every day. And, and a lot of the chapters in the first book are based on the archives. So it's behind the scenes stuff that you would mm. not normally mm -hmm. see. Like why was there only one Nobel prize for vaccines, right? Why didn't the other vaccines get Nobel prizes? And mm -hmm. you get some insight. This one is, largely based on the documents that are public that are made by the Nobel committees. They make very extensive summaries of the science, mm -hmm. right? There are short summaries and then there are right. ones that are pages and pages. And he combines it with a history of the people, which is all public knowledge. And so that's how he can do this. But he doesn't go beyond the 50 years for sure. He says, maybe I'll write some future books when <laughs> you know some more, <laughs> some more of these are opened up, but it's nothing. He's not telling you anything that's inappropriate. Yeah. Anyway, I have to read all of them so I can have an intelligent conversation. But the my my goal is to have a twiv about virology Nobel prizes, and uh, I'm I'm sure some immunology will come up because uh, it's yeah. a, it's kind of intertwined. Yeah, definitely, it is. It is. Right. There's certainly enough immunology Nobel prizes to make a whole episode about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had one last year, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So they start thinking about it in January each year. There are a number and they of give it out October or something, right? Yeah, October. So they have a they have a process. Tuesday? In fact, that's first what you Tuesday. learn in the first book. There's a process oh. they go through, and there are committees, and they nominate people. There are very few nominations from outside the committees, but it's possible. And there are multiple nominations, and then you have to vote, and it's really an interesting process. But hmm. um, it, and you know, as he says, you don't always get it right, and Sometimes you make mistakes. You know, the DNA structure was solved in 1953, but they still were not sure about its importance. So they waited mm. until 1961 or two to give a Nobel for the DNA structure. Mm. He says, we don't want to look silly because the world is watching us. Right. Anyway, they're worth reading because there's a lot of insight that you wouldn't normally see if you're interested in Nobel Prizes. But there's a lot of good science behind it, too. So I would uh, say that you learn about the scientists who are doing this. All right, that's immune number 22. If you listen, please listen on a player where you can subscribe. We'd love you to subscribe so we know how many people are listening. That helps us to get advertising. And if you really like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. We have ways where you, where you could give a dollar or so a month, Patreon or PayPal. That would really help with our expenses. And as, as I said, if you give a dollar, your questions go to the top of the list. And if you have questions or comments, immune at microbe.tv. Cindy Leifer is at Cornell University on Twitter. Cindy Leifer. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you. Steph Langle is at Duke University. Stephanie Langle on Twitter. Thanks, Steph. Yeah, thanks. This is fun. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Music on Immune is by Steve Neal, stevenealpercussion.com. Thanks for listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. We'll be back next month. <laughs>